In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmering and Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the Estate of Richard W. Wyland, Dewey and LaBeouf, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you. LGBT people often excavate a buried collective history so it may be celebrated and claimed as one's own. This month on In the Life, a look back at the Smithsonian's Hide Seek exhibit, which boldly acknowledged for the first time ever signs of sexual difference and LGBT desire expressed in American art. We've been looking at these images for, in some instances, over a century. But we haven't talked about the specifically LGBT content of these works. We also explore the controversy and censorship that ensued after the show opened. You know, they saw crucifix with ants, oh, let's pull that. But they didn't know anything about the artist. Then, the life and work of Samuel Stewart, an openly gay tattoo artist and sexual renegade in the 1950s. We brought everybody together. Act up! Healthcare is right! And we're married! There was nothing for him to hide. Make a promise. I just want to express the appreciation to all of you for coming out to celebrate with us what we honestly believe is a landmark exhibition in Washington, for the portrait gallery certainly, and, and we think in the country. Everything in the exhibition is iconic. We've been looking at these images for, in some instances, over a century. But we haven't talked about the specifically LGBT content of these works, and that's what this exhibition is trying to get at. It's a brilliant way of investigating a whole field that hasn't been investigated, which is the picture behind the picture. And I like the title, Hide and Seek, because it's there in plain sight, but not if you were not looking for it. We began to talk about what was a tacit exclusion of the question of same-sex identity or the same-sex relationship from the museum world. This was a show whose time had come and we needed to make it happen. Portraiture is not just about brushstrokes. It's about identity, it's about what you reveal, what you conceal. It's about a whole question of human personality. The history of LGBTQ art in America has been a game of hide and seek. Precisely lots of images of import to sexual minorities, but never talked about and rarely acknowledged. What we've tried to do by inflecting it through the lives of the artists and the lives of the sitters who, who are depicted is to give you a wholly new slant on portraiture from 1890 or so, coming through the year 2000 and contemporary artists working today. I kind of enjoy creating something that's a bit amb ambiguous in the sense that it can be viewed or interpreted in, in different ways. And I think that that's something that plays into identity and the coming out process. Anthony Jokalea is a remarkable photographer, and I'm particularly compelled by two portraits by Jack Pearson, and they're remarkable because they're both labeled self-portrait, and they're clearly of two different men. He creates a drama of the, the man pining for the inaccessible object of desire, essentially like Blanche Dubois and that young poet that she fell in love with so long ago in the Belle Reve days. When I was doing the Warhol project, since I was inhabiting Andy Warhol's work, I wanted to inhabit his representation, which is why I did myself as Andy in different pieces, like I did the camouflage self-portrait, oh, and I did this one. Portrait, but I called mine Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, because it was self-portrait. Work like Deborah Cass's, which in, or even Andy Warhol's, which involves layers of camouflage, impersonation. Not simple portraits of what I really look like, but complicated acts of seeming. 
In some instances, like the work of Aikens, the question of sexuality becomes extremely complicated because indeed the very word, right, homosexual, was not in wide usage at the time that Aikens painted the image that we're showing. Salutat. It's an image of a boxer, a young boy. He's being applauded by an audience. And the man who stands behind him is looking down at him almost as if to stare. Whereas other painters of boxing showed fisticuffs, showed actual engagement with masculine aggression, this picture takes that image of masculine aggression and turns it into occasion to celebrate the beauty of the young male body. You know, they had to lead a very different sort of life where they had to hide a lot of their personal preferences, um, their sexuality. And I would think even that works by Demeth, there's a, a watercolor of some sailors in the show. And I would imagine he probably made that work for his own pleasure. I find it troublesome that we can only talk about the sexuality of artists who forthrightly first claim it. Why can't we talk about the sexuality of artists who don't claim it, who are, who are long deceased? Why did it take place, as it did very, very recently, that the Metropolitan Museum of Art did an extensive exhibition um, of Aikens' work covering every major historical theme and movement and moment, covering all the scholarship except one kind of scholarship? Now, 25 years of scholarship on sexual difference in Aikens. That was struck from the show, from the wall labels, and from the catalog. I don't believe as an intellectual there's any question you can't ask. And I think it was a question that we wanted to ask about artists in, in, in past time, about what was the relationship between their private life and the artistic expressions that, that they made. And at the case in point, almost the signature for Hide Seek is, is that of Marston Hartley, who's America's really first and still greatest abstractionist, the man who invented a whole style of abstract portraiture, precisely because he was unable to express himself openly as a gay American, a gay artist. Marsner Hartley fell in love with a German officer in the dawning days of World War I. In a series of remarkable portraits called Portrait of a German Officer, Marsner Hartley exposes his incredible love for this man by including his initials, his age at death, his unit. Hartley, who could not in any direct sense expose his feelings, instead was forced to invent a vocabulary in so doing. There may be an awareness that certain artists who people hadn't known were gay are gay. Um, I'm thinking of Grant Wood, for instance, who you know, one always thinks of as this Midwestern artist of a certain era. Until I heard about this exhibition, I wasn't aware of his personal life at all. Here is a figure who is widely understood because of his painting American Gothic as one of the great regionalist figures and a figure who comes to represent, in some sense, American painting of the period. But Grant Wood was a completely self-identified gay figure and in a number of works suggests this pictorially. Everybody thinks of American Gothic, Paul Revere, that, that these were celebrations of American history and of American types. They weren't. They were camp. One of the most signature images for the show is a, a, a remarkable photograph by Berenice Abbott. And it shows Janet Flanner, who was a lesbian uh, journalist in Paris. The picture shows two masks and the masks are removed from the face. She's clearly communicating gender nonconformity, but she's also communicating, in being unmasked, a willingness to expose, right, that gender nonconformity and presumably sexual nonconformity. These very queer pictures that Abbott does in Paris when she's an expatriate, she utterly abandons when she comes back to the United States. To me, it's part of the American dilemma. I mean, why do you think Gertrude Stein didn't want to live in the United States? Why did James Baldwin live in Paris? Why did all the, you know, black jazz musicians and the artists, why did everybody want to leave here? It's because of these underlying cultural problems having to do with Puritan repression of sexuality. 
Harlem was remarkable because it really was conceived of in the context of racist America as a place apart, another country. And to cross the boundary into Harlem was to cross into another social universe. In one of the pictures that we're showing in the exhibition, a beautiful portrait of the white writer of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, Carl von Vechten, a picture of him seated in a white suit and very subtly painted in the background a series of black male faces. It bespeaks a number of important things, one of which is that Carl von Vechten was sexually interested in young black men, but also that he built his career in some sense on an African-American community which nonetheless was behind him. It's a portrait gallery of an elite, and I think any of us looking at these pictures would kill to be in that company would kill to have somebody look at us with the idealizing gaze that Carl Van Vechten lavishes on these figures. What makes an individual unique? What is it about uh, each person's personality, values, life experience that is revealed through a good portrait? And to some extent, what is not revealed but concealed? Uh, in what way is portraiture a mask uh, or a code that you need to study in order to better understand the person? Jasper Johnson, Robert Rauschenberg. They had a relationship for a number of years, and a number of the paintings that we think of as iconic images of American um, painting are in fact, if you will, encoded pictorial missives, letters to one another, responding to each other's art. I saw the Jasper Johns retrospective at the Whitney in 1977, and I had never seen art like that in my life, particularly in memory of my feelings, which I recognized right away was an homage to my favorite Frank O'Hara poem. I felt that there was a triangulated love affair possible between me, Jasper Johns, and Frank O'Hara. The image is a kind of reversal of the first image that Jasper Johns made upon developing his relationship, which would last for seven or eight years, with Robert Rauschenberg, the most important relationship in either painter's life. One side of the picture shows a fork and a spoon wired together, as if, right, spooning. And on the other side of the picture, the spoon and the fork are separated. And indeed, the picture is about the end of a relationship, the end of their relationship. The exhibition arcs forward from the 1890s with the, the very definition of the category of the homosexual through to 1969 with the Stonewall riot and the emergence of the modern gay liberation movement. But then out of left field comes the AIDS ec epidemic circa 1983. You have people, Robert Mapplethorpe would be a good example, Keith Haring would be another, who are just beginning to experience the delights of freedom as they have to confront their own and others' mortality. The an incredible series of mourning portraits that we think speak to the experience of a community in crisis, a community that is being decimated. Those are the most painful portraits in the exhibition, where you, you literally, in A.A. Bronson's portrait, Felix, of his artistic collaborator at the moment of his death. A lot of the portraits in this show, I think, are involved in the construction of a gay canon, gay and lesbian canon of taste. I felt comforted looking at these images as if I were a Catholic going to St. Peter's and looking at all my favorite saints. You say, oh, there's, you know, St. Gertrude, there's St. Frank, St. Langston. Um, he died for my sins. Isn't he cute, you know? We didn't want to make an alternative American history. We wanted to take the American history that everybody knew, the American art history that is the story that every museum tells, and show how profoundly it was cross-cut with questions of sexual difference and sexual identity. I mean, that layer of America, which we can refer to as high culture, it was developed and supported by gay Americans. If you think about uh, the opera, the ballet, the theater, the art museums, not to mention the contributions of individual artists, you, you just, you wouldn't have it. Representing Keith Haring in this exhibition is his last work of art. It's called Unfinished Painting. It consists not simply of an unfinished painting, but an unfinished tapestry. There's only a corner of it. 
and strings are hanging down where the worker was going to finish it. And of course, what that indicates is a life cut short, a work of art that, that was unable to be completed. But I'd like, in a way, to look at it the other way, that it's up to us to finish that painting. It's up to us to complete American culture in a way that, that's commensurate with our, with our own great goals, our own great ambitions, and our own great dreams for equality and diversity. But I want us to look again at how it is we came to be American. And I think this exhibition does that. I think it adds a strand to the unfinished tapestry, the unfinished painting of Keith Herrick. To be a portrait gallery that represents the American people today, we have to be many things. We have to be about gender diversity, age diversity, ethnicity, and uh, sexual identity, uh, which is part of American life. So we feel this is a step for the portrait gallery toward uh, filling out the contours of what it means to be an American today. One month after Hide Seek opened, the Smithsonian stunned the art world by removing one of the works in the show, a video called Fire in My Belly by the late artist David Wanarovich. Someone from the press called him that the Smithsonian had pulled a piece and what did we think of it? I was thinking, why? It didn't surprise me. What surprised me was that that was the image, the Christ on the cross with the ants. The Smithsonian censored the video after complaints by Catholic League president Bill Donahue that Fire in My Belly's depiction of a crucifix with ants on it was anti-Catholic hate speech. The federally funded Smithsonian is coming under fire this morning. For Conservative lawmakers also began to attack the Smithsonian's funding and denounced the show Hide Seek. Which is really perverted, um, sick stuff. Uh, the old game was, right, there's a queer, excise it. That's a politics of diminishing return. So what they've done is they had to invent a red herring, religious hate speech. It was an interesting choice for a piece to be censored from that show because I think, you know, they saw crucifix with ants, oh, let's pull that. But they didn't know anything about the artist. Like much of his work, Wanarovich made fire in my belly as a response to the AIDS epidemic. Wanarovich himself died in 1992 from AIDS-related complications. He wasn't just a painter, he was a writer, he was a photographer, he was a doodler, he would make things. It was in his blood. I mean, I don't know, you know, it's not like somebody says, oh, maybe I'll become an artist, you know. He was an artist. What's happened now is that the museums and the art world have broadly supported us, and this film is being shown in venues all across the, the country and indeed throughout the world. The show Hide Seek, along with the video Fire In My Belly, opens at the Brooklyn Museum in November 2011 and travels to the Tacoma Art Museum in March 2012. The decision was always very clear in our minds that a Fire In My Belly started out as a piece in the show and that it needed to remain a piece in the show in Brooklyn. So there's never any question that we would edit out a work. When I apologized at the beginning of all of this to Tom, David's surviving partner, and said, you know, I'm so sorry that this has been a controversy all over again. He said, don't be stupid. David would have loved this. To be still relevant long after his death, absolutely right on. And I think in some sense, that's exactly the case. Why have we given a free pass to our cultural institutions and not held them to a standard that they must include our lives, or to put it another way, stop editing us out of American history? A man of his very own extraordinary invention, Samuel Stewart lived decades before the 1969 Stonewall Rebellion. Yet his sexual identity was never in question. Sex was central to his life, and he had lots of it. This is the stud file. It's Sam's lifelong record of all of the people that he had sex with in the course of his life. Um, there's almost 900 cards in here, and it's very carefully cross-referenced and indexed. Written in code, pull it open. Sam was trained as a librarian at Ohio State University. With each of these cards, he has the name of the person, the activities they engaged in, the dates they engaged in them, penile dimensions. So it's a very detailed and often quite humorous set of cards. 
Author Justin Spring chronicles the life of Samuel Stewart, professor, tattoo artist, and sexual renegade in his book, Secret Historian. A Secret Historian is a biography about a man very few people have heard about, and in that way it's sort of a unique biography. So I was out at a, a, a bookstore called A Different Light. There I found on the shelves, just sitting there, this series of novels by a person called Phil Andros. I recognized immediately that I was in the hands of a storyteller who just happened to write stories about men having sex with other men. I took them home, I collected them, I shared them with people, and they all agreed that these were extraordinary tales, but we didn't know who Phil Andros was. Years later, I came across this man, Sam Stewart, who was also friends with Gertrude Stein and Thornton Wilder and Alice Toklas and lived a literary life. Then it turned out he ran a tattoo parlor. That's strange. And then reading and reading, I finally realized this was Phil Andros. This man was the same person. I began trying to figure out everything I possibly could about this man. It took me a couple of years, but I finally found the man who was the executor of the Sam Stewart estate, and it turned out that he had just boxed up everything after Sam died, and he invited me to come out and look through it. And when I got there, I realized I'd hit the jackpot, <laughs> you know, just this incredible, it was sort of like a Alibaba's cave of 1930s, 40s, and 50s sexuality. Sam was a literary man from the very earliest. His poetry collection and his first novel were well received. He was going to go on and become a novelist, like so many of his literary heroes. He was also working and living as a university professor, teaching English literature. And he got sidetracked, uh, first by alcoholism. And then after he was able to get sober, his sex life kind of blossomed and became very central to his life in a way that also sidetracked his literary ventures. In late 1949, Sam met pioneering sex researcher Alfred Kinsey and became an unofficial collaborator. Stewart's highly detailed documentation of his sexual experiences underscored and supported Kinsey's controversial findings about men having sex with other men. So a lot of Sam's literary talent was poured into diaries that were meant expressly for Kinsey. And Sam's diaries are amazing. They're over a thousand pages typewritten of his sexual adventures, experiences, his thoughts about his sexuality, and really turns it into something more like a novel. But Sam was an unbelievably truthful man in these diaries and journals um, because he felt like he was creating a testament, not only for himself, but for Kinsey and for sex researchers of the future, for people who really wanted to know what was going on in society. By the early 1950s, Sam had transformed his life. He chose what was then a socially objectionable profession with a clientele limited to hustlers, sailors, bikers, and street thugs. For Sam, it presented a perfect medley of sexual prospects. Sam Stewart became Phil Sparrow, tattoo artist. There was a creative element in him that was just very powerful and very exciting to be around because he created these wonderful things. When he really made that break and became a tattoo artist, and began doing his illustrations and decorating his apartment in this outlandish way. It was as if his entire life became this artwork, and even if he couldn't share that artwork with anybody, he would live in the center of it. It, it became a kind of private world. In 1966, one young man entered Sam's private world in Oakland, California, where Sam had a tattoo parlor he would become one of the most commercially successful tattoo artists in the United States. His name, Don Hardy, later known as Ed Hardy. He knew Sam Stewart as Phil Sparrow. It of course impressed me with Sam, the entire setup of the shop, the first time I saw it, this guy is coming from somewhere different. It was much more like an art studio, he had classical music playing. And all the flash was hand painted. It was obviously created you know, by Just hand for the, for the shop. shop, which was kind of unique in those days. In those days, tattooing was so underground, it was such a closed shop. I did my first probably five or six tattoos in his shop under his tutelage on, on art school friends and put the first one on myself, as was traditional, with him looking over my shoulders. Okay, so Don, here's um, some of what I came across when I found the Stewart Archive. This one always cracks me up because it looks like one of those peasant blouses that were popular it's, in the 1930s, right, yeah, right, yeah. you know, yeah. like for gals, yeah. right? And here's your motorcycle guy, tough yeah. tattoos with the motorcycle boots and yeah. the jeans. Typical tattoos, the panther crawling back, black panther, panther head, and 
Stinky the Skunk. Was, I mean, all these things are so iconic for that era. Sam and hated it, Stinky. He just, because he had to put on so many of them. Oh, yeah, just all of us, it became just this thing, and you're like, not another one yet. And of course, but it paid the rent. So Sam would be laughing from wherever he is about the fact that tattooing, which he saw as really a dying folk art, you know, and his interest, of course, was largely sociological, anthropological, sexual, and uh, as well as artistic. Now, the revival, even of interest in those classic, corny sort of Americana designs is huge. You see young people walking around, they look like they were tattooed in like 1940, all the images on them. And the classic, the chest eagle, which has remained a classic. And here's one of the sweetest images ever. Sam made this when he made his change over from being a professor to a tattoo artist. He opened his tattoo parlor and he sent greetings from Phil Sparrow to all his friends with a a reindeer putting a Merry Christmas tattoo on Santa Claus. It's great with the, Santa's beard, you know, draped, in looped, the yeah, draped over the antlers, <laughs> like moving the beard out of the way so you can tattoo the chest, you know. And of course, Sam being Sam, the big sexy boots are part of Santa's uh, sure. uh, Santa f fashion statement. Right? Highly polished, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there was a whole history of generations, two or three generations of gay men who we knew that they existed, but we didn't have any day-to-day -day awareness of what their life was like. Quite apart from the sensational nature of Sam's life, for me to uh, reconstruct that life in painstaking detail was also to reconstruct what it was like to be a gay person in 1925, 1935, 1945, 1955, 1965. Samuel Stewart died in obscurity on New Year's Eve in 1993. He was 84. Thank you for watching In the Life. To watch more historical coverage from the last 20 years of In the Life, visit our website at itlmedia.org. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmering and Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, Dewey and LaBeouf, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you.